Welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis class. I'm Vicki Colvin. What we're going to be doing in this mini lecture is just catching up on one little item that is often not covered in textbooks, but incredibly important if you do chromatography, which is the odd problem of weird peak shapes. So we've always assumed then pretended that our chromatography peaks are these ideal Gaussians. And if anybody out there has ever done chromatography, I know some of you have, that's a rare occurrence. There's always things that make your, make your peaks look a little strange. And what this lecture is simply about is some basic information about thinking that problem through should you actually face it in reality. And these two citations down here give some really nice discussions of funny peak shape effects in chromatography. So here's a couple of examples of the kinds of peak shapes that you actually may see in practice. Sometimes you'll get something called overloading, as I'll describe in a second, in which your peak basically looks like you're missing everything that comes at long times. Or sometimes you get tailing, which is you get this very long tail to very long times. And these deviations can cause a lot of issues. It can make it difficult to, for example, estimate the width of the peak. If you've got two overlapping peaks or near peaks and there's one that's a funny shape, it can be very difficult to quantitate it or separate the peaks. And it's just in general a sign that the system isn't working right. So what you want to do is sort of characterize the asymmetry of a peak. And there's some two different ways that I've seen people do it in different textbooks. This is not a standardized thing, but these are at least common ways of doing it. One is to use something called the asymmetry factor. And what you do there is you simply get the intensity of your peak at the max, and you go to 10% of that value where you draw the baseline of the chromatography separation. And at that point, you measure the time to the leading edge and then the time to the trailing edge. And the division of those two factors will give you some sense of asymmetry. So of course, in a perfect calcium, those two are equal and you get one. And if it's a trailing peak, then 1.2 over one, let's say, you're gonna see that being greater than one. And of course, if it's got an overload problem, you're gonna see it being less than one. The other way that I've seen a lot of people do it is to use something called the tailing factor, which is really particularly specific to tailing which is just as defined here, you take the whole width of the peak now at 5% of the peak max, and you divide that by twice the sort of trailing width. So these are just two examples. Asymmetry factor might be slightly more common, but they give you a way of saying, okay, it's kind of bad or it's really, really bad. And generally, if you have asymmetry factors that are in excess of two, you really can't use the separation. Something is fundamentally wrong with what you're doing, and you need to address the asymmetry in your peaks before you do any certainly quantitative analysis and possibly even qualitative. So why are the peaks funny shaped? <laughs> so let me give you some two quick explanations for the most common reasons, although there's five or six different reasons. Um, so a good way to start is to remember that the retention time of a peak, K, or capacity factor, is related directly to that partition coefficient, or big K. So you might remember that little k, or capacity factor, is equal to big K. And that's a proportionality constant that should look just like the line here. So the concentration in the mobile phase and the stationary phase should always be a ratio, and it should be independent of the amount of material that's present in the mobile phase. But that's not the case. So one possibility is you can get overloading, in which you actually get a higher concentration in the stationary phase than one would expect. Or conversely, you can get tailing, where you have a lower concentration in the stationary phase than you would expect. Both of those lead to funny shapes. So let's talk a little bit about the overload issue. So in overloading, what's happening is K is not actually staying constant. So we would expect if you went from 0 0.10 molar to 10 molar, that you would still have this relationship holding. But the problem is that here's a case where you don't have a lot of analyte present in the mobile phase, and so you get a nice uniform distribution out because the partition coefficients from the tailing end and the leading end of the peak are all identical. But now let's look if you overload your column. Well, what happens at the peak height is that you've got so much analyte in the column that it starts to look a lot like the analyte. It's kind of like having a sponge that's oversaturated with water. Well, it's going to absorb more water. And when it does that, its partition is actually going to increase. So when you do this measurement then, the material that's at the, the tailing end of the peak has a capacity factor of 100, and the material at the leading edge will have a capacity factor of 100, but the stuff in the middle where you have the most stuff actually apparently has a higher capacity factor because now the analyte is more soluble in the stationary phase because there's so much of it in there. 
So what happens then is you get the leading and the lagging edge both kind of come out when they're supposed to, but the stuff in the middle trails it, and you get a really unusual peak shape shown here. And so as you get more and more analyte into the column, you actually manipulate and change that partition coefficient. So the assumption of a proportionality constant here is predicated on the fact that the stationary phase is not going to fundamentally change as the analyte goes into it. If that does happen, then you have to modify this equation and you get funny shapes. So what do you do to fix it? It's pretty easy. You just don't put as much stuff into your column. Okay, the tailing factor is another really common thing you'll see, particularly in liquid chromatography. What's happening there is that you have a distribution of partition coefficients. So your column is pretty much all one material, but there are defects. Think of them as little pits. And when the analyte encounters one of those defects, it sticks. And it actually has a higher partition. In effect, it's sticking longer to that place than it would be to the kind of normal stationary phase. So it's like you have two stationary phases present in the column. And what that does is it stretches the peak out because some of the material is kind of hanging on to the, hanging on to the column. And so what you see then is a nice front end, going to be quite asymmetric, but you get this long tail to longer elution times because these defects are hanging onto the analyte and kind of keeping them in place. They're kind of hanging up. And that's because the columns will actually not be perfect. So there are always difficulty making a perfect column, particularly in HPLC. And you're going to have some defect sites that bind those analytes just a little too strongly. And that's going to lead to tailing. Now, you can use a more expensive column. Companies have gotten really good. They are better and better at the chemistry so that you don't have as many defects. Or another cheaper thing to do, because often you pay a lot for those columns, is to use a tail suppressant. So for example, a lot of amines can be used in small concentrations. And they effectively go and they hang on to those defect sites. And they block them for the analyte coming over. So that's another strategy that you can use. So I hope I've given you a sense that peaks can have funny shapes. You can quantify how funny those shapes are. And if you get asymmetry factors greater than 2, you're going to have to fix your separation. The two things that can happen is you can get overloading on the column. That's going to give you one kind of strange peak shape that kind of looks like you don't have a back end to the peak. And then you can get tailing, which is kind of the opposite, where you have a long tail going on. And in both cases, for overloading, you just put less material onto your column. And if you have a tailing problem, you're going to want to either use a suppressant, what's called a tailing suppressant, or you're going to want to clean your column or get a new column that doesn't have as many defect sites. Thanks so much, and I'll see you next time.